Great, well that music sounded really good. The singing sounded really good from the front. Really appreciate our musicians. Um, thank you for being here as well on this, uh, I think we could call it a holiday weekend. Kids have been off Friday and Monday. Um, we've had our own family reunited, which has been great. I went to see a rugby game yesterday afternoon. Um, D-side against Gordonians, was that it? Yes, saw my son playing and when he was being hit, I was praying against the guy who was hitting him. And when Mark was hitting them, I was saying, get in there, Mark. So <laughs> the bias is evident as you go. Hope you're enjoying your weekends as well. Nice to see some visitors here as well who can make the opportunity of this. Um, just remember books that were at the back last week. Um, all the Mark devotionals went. Um, if you would like, still like a copy of the Mark devotional we were mentioning last week, a daily Bible reading guide, um, just let me know. I have a few spares still here. And there was also this Gospel of Mark, just in neat leaflet form for you to read through yourself. And then after you've read it, to give it away to somebody who's not yet a Christian. So, um, and inside that, you'll remember we had our little Eric Little Race for Life leaflet. Um, really good to pick up on the Eric Little story, which is now 100 years old. And uh, it would be a great thing to hand out to, to somebody as well, particularly with all these evangelistic events that have come and uh, are still to come. So please keep that in mind. Let's pray now, and please have your Bibles open. Mark chapter 1, 35 to 45. Let's hear the Word of God. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would um, reveal Jesus to us today. Um, thank you that your Word is like no other. This ancient text that we open, we read stories about Jesus, and yet it's the same Jesus today, 2,000 years later. He's doing the same things in our lives as he did back then. Thank you that he's a living Jesus and help us to sense His presence today by Your Holy Spirit, and help us to move closer to Him today from whatever our starting point is. We pray this for Your glory. Amen. Now, I'm sure some of you have heard the name Stephen Covey. Stephen Covey became famous with his best-selling book entitled The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Maybe I should have read it all the way through. That book has sold over 20 million copies now. And Covey is known as a kind of leadership guru who tells business leaders in particular how to organize their lives for maximum effectiveness. And one of his most famous quotes is about setting priorities in our lives. And this is what he wrote. He wrote, the key is not to prioritize what's on your schedule. The key is to schedule your priorities. In other words, if your priorities aren't right in the first place, then it doesn't really matter how well you achieve them. It's less about doing things right and more about doing the right things. And when we come to the life of Jesus, so much of Jesus' teaching and the testimony of how He lived His life is asking us, it's challenging us to reassess our priorities. And the question for us this morning is, how should a Christian prioritize his or her life? And we discover that Jesus has very different priorities to the ones that our culture gives us, or even sometimes that our church gives us. Before we prioritize our schedule, we need to schedule our priorities. And this morning is, is really a key moment for us to take a step back, to stop and think. What are the key principles that drive my life every day? And how do those principles differ from Jesus? Let's face it, life passes by so quickly and often chaotically that we need to make sure our priorities are in line with Jesus as we go. And Mark is calling us here quite simply to let Jesus shape our priorities. Will you this morning, as you hear His Word, will you let Jesus shape your priorities? And this passage from Mark 1 reveals three priorities of Jesus that run counter to our instincts. That's the whole point. His priorities run counter to the way we think so often. So firstly, Jesus prioritizes prayer over productivity. 
Verse 35 of the passage, Jesus prioritizes prayer over productivity. Let's remember the context of this passage. Jesus had just spent the previous day healing people. In the morning, he had expelled a demon in the synagogue. In the afternoon, he had healed Peter's mother-in-law. And in the evening, he had healed a whole crowd of people who had been lining up at the door of Peter's house. What a productive day. I mean, if Jesus could just pack every day with this level of productivity, what an impact he could make in a very short space of time. How many lives could he bless? How many bodies could he heal? But Jesus' response to the previous day was totally the opposite. Verse 35, we're told, and rising very early in the morning, each phrase is key here, rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and he went out to a desolate place and there he prayed. So Jesus was deliberately placing prayer over productivity. And you'll notice his intentionality here is striking. He didn't pray in his room. He went away while it was still dark. You've got a plan to do that. Where there would be no distractions. And he spent time alone with his father. And that was just after one day of public ministry. Jesus wanted to spend time with God to refocus his mind on why he was doing all the teaching and all the healing he was doing before the swelling crowds and constant demands set the tone for his life. And this clearly wasn't a five-minute prayer time quickly snatched. This was a prolonged period of prayer away from everyone and everything else. Now, Mark doesn't tell us what he prayed. He's emphasizing that he prayed. And his top priority at the beginning of the day was to pray without any distractions. And that is such a challenge in our age of smartphones and 24-hour media and working eight till late. It's also a real challenge for what might be called a type A church. Could I call us that? A few years ago, the ladies held an evangelistic event at Deeside and they invited a speaker. And as part of the evening, this speaker did a personality quiz and she was amazed to find how many type A personalities we have here, more than any other church that she had done this with. And I'm sure it's the same among the men. We want to be doers. We want to be active and proactive in our spiritual lives, which is just great. And Deeside's one of the most active churches you could find anywhere. But there is a real danger in having a church full of Marthas. We can easily start to judge ourselves and each other according to our levels of productivity rather than spirituality. Jesus prioritized prayer over productivity. Now, that didn't make him lazy. He was powerfully active, but he recognized the need to ask for God's power and to soak in God's presence. That's what made his ministry so fruitful. His activities were the overflow of his relationship with God. And when you separate those two, when you get involved in a lot of Christian service without all of that service being soaked in prayer, you end up forgetting why you're doing what you're doing. And you can become bitter at those who are not doing as much as you're doing. And your work will not be blessed. Quite simply because you haven't asked for a blessing. Spending intentional set-apart time in prayer allows all our activities to have the fragrance of Christ about them. We parent differently. We go to work differently. We teach Sunday school differently. We lead home group differently. And we are prompted to witness when we have spent time with Christ and ask for His wisdom and His power in everything we do and say. You remember that lovely scene, Peter and John, those uneducated fishermen, are, are spellbinding as they speak to the Sanhedrin about Jesus. They speak to the Jewish leadership. 
And Acts 4.13 tells us the reason why. Acts 4.13 says, The Jewish leadership took note that these men had been with Jesus. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if people could say that about us? Every time I speak with Mary, every time I speak with Dave, every time we meet up for a coffee, it's so clear that he or she has spent time with Jesus. Are we regularly going into the inner courts of the heavenly temple that change our hearts as we do it? There's a fascinating image in the Old Testament when when the prophet Daniel prayed his great prayer for the nation of Israel from his place of exile. He's in exile in Babylon and he's praying for the exiles to be released actually. We're told that after his prayer, the angel Gabriel personally appeared to Daniel after his prayer. And this is what the angel said, Daniel 9.23. This is the same angel that appears to Mary in the New Testament, of course. Daniel 9.23, at the beginning of your prayer, Daniel, a word went out for the captives to be released from Babylon, and I've come to tell you personally, for you are greatly loved. Loved by who? He's living in exile in Babylon. He's surrounded by pagans everywhere he goes. Well, Daniel was known for his prayer life, not just in Babylon, but in heaven where it really counts. Daniel did not stop praying regularly, even when it meant going to the lion's den. And it's because Daniel was so loved in heaven's courts that God sent the word to release the Babylonian captives after 70 years of captivity. Oh, to be known and loved in heaven's courts, knowing that God delights to hear and answer our prayers. Prayer, of course, is way more than just asking God for things. Prayer is enjoying God. It is praising Him. It is spending intentional time with Him. It's casting our cares upon Him. It is learning to seek His kingdom first. And we learn it more and more as we spend time in His presence. So when you start to think about prayer like that, what else are you going to do this week that compares in magnificence to a child of God bowing his knee before the creator of the cosmos, calling him Father, and asking that his will may be done on earth as it is in heaven? What's a bigger deal to you than that this week? Prayer is so often a default thing for us. It's the thing we do only when we're in a crisis or when we've got some spare time on our hands. Jesus didn't pray here because he had some spare time. He prayed intentionally early in the morning so that his whole day, so that his whole life would be infused with God. And if he didn't do it, his life couldn't possibly be infused with God. The writer John Macefield said, God warms his hands by the fire of a man's heart when he is praying. So this whole passage is about Jesus having totally different priorities to us, us learning his priorities. And firstly, he emphasized prayer over productivity. Secondly, he emphasized the spiritual over the physical. He emphasized the spiritual over the physical. That's verses 36 to 39. So Peter was perturbed to wake up and find that Jesus had left the house the next morning, as you would be. Where's Jesus? Can't see him in his room. And so were many others after all Jesus' healing had created such a buzz in the town. Verse 36, we're told, And Simon and those who were with him searched for Jesus, and they found him and said to him, Everyone's looking for you. Well, why was everyone looking for Jesus? Well, they were looking for him because he was now the healer who met their immediate physical needs. But Jesus was very wary of the crowds and what they wanted him to be. So in verse 38, very surprisingly, he said to them, let's go on, let's go on to the next towns that I may 
preach there also, for that is why I came. So Jesus was risking coming across as callous here. He wasn't going to spend any more time with the crowds who were looking for him to heal because his mission was to preach the gospel in towns who hadn't heard it yet. And this will become a constant theme in Mark's gospel. Jesus puts our spiritual needs ahead of our physical needs. He hadn't come to be a miracle worker first and foremost, which naturally led him to be a hero figure among Galilean peasants. Of course it did. No, Jesus turned away from that and he had come to preach about getting our souls right with God. That was a bigger need actually than physical blindness or paralysis or lameness. Now, of course, he healed a lot of people out of compassion. But he also healed to show that he really was the Son of God who had come to save us. His healing gave him that authority, as it were, or revealed his authority. But Jesus prioritized the forgiveness of sins over healing miracles. You'll remember that famous story later on in Mark's Gospel. We'll come to it. The scene where those men, excellent men, lower their paralyzed friend through the roof. Remember, you can imagine that, taking all the bricks out or whatever on these flat Jewish roofs. They lowered the man, they lowered their friend to to be in front of Jesus because there were crowds milling all around Jesus. And Jesus' first words to those men were, can you remember? We'll come to it. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven? Sorry, Jesus, you've got the wrong idea here. I mean, thank you very much for forgiveness of sins, but that's not what we're here for. We want you to heal our friend. Can't you see? We've gone to enormous lengths so that you'll heal our friend. And of course, Jesus did heal him. But his reason for healing the man, if you can remember the quote, was to show that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins. In other words, healing is not the number one thing. Forgiving sins is. The healing of our souls is infinitely more important than the healing of our bodies or any other urgent need that you may have in your life if you have a truly eternal perspective. Every body that Jesus healed would one day die again and then that soul would stand before God for the great final reckoning where it really counted. And the healing of a body a few years earlier would make no difference to that whatsoever. The healing of our bodies affects a very short period of time. The healing of our souls, that's the issue of eternity. And maybe we, we come to Jesus like these crowds do. We we want him to deal with our most urgent felt needs. Lord, heal my body. Lord, fix my marriage. Lord, look after my finances. Help my children or grandchildren. The myriad of problems and distractions that they face. And of course, Jesus has compassion on all of those issues in our lives, and he wants us to bring those issues to him. But he wants us to come first and foremost as the one who died on the cross to forgive our sins. He wants to deal with the eternal issues in our lives ahead of the temporary ones, the much larger spiritual issues ahead of the physical ones. And if we come to Jesus simply and only to have our felt needs met while ignoring our need for repentance and eternal salvation, then we will be disappointed by Jesus. Lots of people have been disappointed by Jesus. Jesus thought you were going to heal me. You didn't. So I'm out of here. It's so easy for us to focus on the needs of the moment, the here and now. And if you're paralyzed, it seems way more important than having your sins forgiven. But it's not. Jesus loves us too much to meet temporary needs at the expense of eternal needs. In fact, sometimes Jesus will leave us in physical or emotional distress of some kind, even for a prolonged period of time, so that we can grow in Him spiritually. Isn't that true? Isn't that the story of many of our lives? C.S. Lewis famously said, God whispers to us in our pleasures. We can barely hear him. 
He speaks to us in our consciences, but he shouts at us in our pain. Pain is God's megaphone to arouse a deaf world. And maybe God is allowing you to go through a time of real personal distress right now. Members of this church gone through long, long term stress and suffering. And you keep praying for Him to remove that pain. Keep praying. He wants you to pray. But heaven's just not answering. And you think, Jesus, do you not care? He does care. He cares massively. But mature believers have found throughout the ages, this is not a new thing, they have found throughout the ages that they grow more spiritually during moments of pain and suffering and sorrow than they ever did when they were trouble-free. Isn't that a fact? It's certainly been a fact in my life. And Jesus has that longer lens that sees the eternal issues beyond the temporal. Now, of course, He does heal, and He can heal. But He has a larger purpose. Forgiving our sins, bringing us eternal life, and then chiseling out the likeness of Christ in our hearts through all the trials and struggles of life where we learn to trust Him even when He doesn't give us the answers that we want, when we want them. I mean, if you only trust God when He gives you what you want, you're not really trusting Him at all. That's not faith. Your trust in God has to be tested through patient endurance. That's why we have totally bizarre verses like James verse 1. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. You're crying out to heaven and heaven saying, no, 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 no. Because you know, as heaven's saying no, you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfast endurance. So you become unshakable as a believer. Do you remember the parable of the sower where those people accepted the gospel very quickly and then they rose, they seemed to spring up. Wow, isn't that a great Christian? And then suffering comes and they're knocked off completely because they had no root. How do you develop a root? Without a root, there will be no fruit. How do you develop a root? Because God will try and test, and He will take you almost to the end of yourself. I've been praying for this issue, Lord, for five years, ten years, twenty years, thirty years, and still I trust you. In fact, Job got to the point where he said, even if God slays me, I will trust Him. There's the greatest faith in the whole of the Old Testament. Exactly the same faith that Jesus shows on the cross. God, even if you crucify me and abandon me while I'm being crucified, I'll still trust that you will bring something glorious out of it. Do you see? Our whole gospel's built on this. Consider it joy, my brothers, not in the middle of the trials. That's masochism. Consider it joy, my brothers, as you see God's big picture. When you're praying for him to release this pain from your life and he doesn't, He's wanting to produce steadfast endurance, unshakability, so that you really belong in the unshakable kingdom he's taking you to. Do you see? Look through his longer lens. Jesus prioritizes the spiritual over the physical, often when we don't want him to, because he wants to bless us eternally. His priorities are so different to ours. That's the whole point of this passage. He prioritizes prayer over productivity. He prioritizes the spiritual over the physical. And thirdly, he prioritizes obedience over acceptance. He prioritizes obedience over acceptance. Now follow this through with me. It's the story of the leper now, verses 40 to 45. Verse 40, we're told a leper came to Jesus imploring him and kneeling said to him, if you will, if you're wanting to, Jesus, if you're wanting to, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. Now, the key issue for lepers in that society was one of acceptance. If you were a leper... 
You had to live in a leper colony far away from others so that they couldn't catch this horrific disease. And if you saw anybody coming close, you had to ring a bell to warn them to keep a distance. Imagine how horrible that felt every day. Lepers were rejected. They were outcasts from society. And so you can see the beauty of Jesus healing this leper by a physical touch. We know, of course, Jesus doesn't have to touch people. He can just say the word and they're healed. Jesus deliberately touches this leper, that moment of real acceptance. And the leper is able to reintegrate into society. Verse 44, Jesus says, Go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded. The priest will pass you to come back into regular society. Cleansed lepers had to be approved before they could re-enter normal society, attend the synagogue, for example, and worship God. But here's where the power of this story lies. You have the miracle covered in just a couple of verses. Then there's the lengthy bit. Why the lengthy bit? Well, Jesus told the leper here not to tell anyone who had healed him. But verse 45 says, he went out and he began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that... Jesus could not openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places. You notice if you see the whole passage, it begins with desolate places where Jesus goes to pray, and it ends in desolate places. Jesus is in desolate places. So can you see the big picture of what's happening here? Because Jesus healed the leper, the leper was accepted back. He was welcomed back into society. But Jesus then became the isolated one. He couldn't go into the town. He had to stay in these desolate places. In order to heal the leper, Jesus took the isolation that the leper had experienced so that the leper could be accepted back in society. What a beautiful picture of the gospel we have here, the cross of Christ. And you'll see these kind of hidden layers in these simple gospel stories. Jesus was deliberately crucified outside the city wall of Jerusalem in a desolate place of rejection. And he died there, abandoned by God the Father himself, so that you and I could be accepted back into a relationship with God. Or to put it another way, Jesus put obedience over acceptance. Jesus willingly went to a cross in obedience to his Father's will. It was God's plan that Jesus would be rejected by the world, that he would hang on a cross in God-forsaken darkness like a leper shamed in his leper colony so that you and I who had been strangers and enemies of God, could be welcomed into the family of God as sons and daughters. You see, Jesus prioritized obedience over acceptance so that he could be the Savior that we need. Jesus could so easily have gone down the populist route here with, with all the power that he had at his disposal. Everybody's looking for you, Jesus. They want to make you a celebrity. They want to make you king. Crowds were clamoring after his healing touch. They were transfixed by his authoritative teaching. And you ask yourselves at this early stage of the gospel, how could a hero figure like that end up naked on a cruel cross, rejected by people he had healed? And it's all because Jesus intentionally chose obedience over acceptance. The way of the cross instead of the acclaim of this world. And you and I are faced with the same challenge every day, aren't we, as Christians? Will we follow in Jesus' footsteps, choosing obedience over acceptance? Living intentionally in a way, in a way that brings rejection from people all around us so that we can obey the Father, stick to His straight line? Will we stand up for Jesus' values in a world that despises him? Will we speak up for Jesus in a world where he is just not welcomed, where his values are hated? Are we prepared to lose popularity in the office, in the classroom, in our family homes? Are we prepared to lose friendships, strained relationships for the sake of Jesus Christ? If we are, then we are walking in his footsteps. 
the one who chose obedience over acceptance so that you and I could be welcomed into the Father's arms as his sons and daughters. If you're not a Christian here this morning, this question comes particularly to you, I think. A friend of mine was saying he had a non-Christian friend, and the non-Christian friend was saying to him, look, I, I don't know, I, I'm working out, I'm still trying to work out, is Christianity worth it? Is it worth it? This person was facing up to the issue that if he became a Christian, it would mean he would lose some of his social network. He would lose some of his worldly esteem. That's true. We're not trying to paint a sweet, gentle picture of what it means to become a Christian because it's not sweet and gentle. It's costly. It sets you apart. That's what the word holy means, set apart. And this is the decision you've got to make. And yes, it is worth it. But you'll really see that it's worth it when you've surrendered all committed to the man of sorrows, walk that rugged road with him, and then end up crowned with him in glory. That's when we will know that it's eternally worth it. Until then, well, we're like the apostles, the last men being dragged into the arena. That's what it looks like to be a Christian. Facing the shame and reproach that Jesus faced so that he will be thrilled to place a crown on our heads one day. That's Christianity. Counting the cost. So as you think now, will I become a Christian or will I not? Know that Jesus is inviting you to carry your cross for him. But if you do that, the road to eternal glory opens wide for you. That's the decision. May the Holy Spirit help you to make that decision today, right now. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back. No turning back. Amen. Let's take a moment of quiet. We're going to go into communion. We're going to sing before that. But let's take a moment of quiet now to reflect on what God's been saying to our hearts. Then I'll pray and then we'll sing the potter's hand. Heavenly Father, in a way, your, your word to us this morning is so simple, and that's the problem. As we think about how we're going to live this week, would you help us to prioritize prayer over productivity? We want to serve you, we want to be faithful to you, but we know we cannot do that. We will not bear fruit unless our lives are soaked in prayer. And you invite us, you welcome us to come to know you deeply, not superficially. Help us, Lord, to prioritize the spiritual over the physical. Pray especially for those who are really struggling physically right now and it's affecting everything. Can't sleep properly, can't eat properly, can't walk properly. And there's no end in sight. Heavenly Father, by your grace and power, I pray for those folks that they will know your closeness this week. If it be your divine will to heal them, I pray in Jesus' name that you would heal them because we know that Jesus has the power. He can just speak the word and it will happen. But if it, if it is not your will to heal, then we know you have your reasons and you wish to produce in us this patient endurance, this unshakable trust in you. And Father, we dare to pray, do whatever it takes in our lives to produce this unshakable confidence in you.
even if he slays me, still will I trust him. Father, by your spirit, will you get us to that place, we pray, knowing that Jesus himself entrusted his very body and soul to you on a cruel cross. And thank you that we are the fruits of that sacrifice. You raised him from the dead three days later to show that you so approved of the trials and tribulations he was willing to pass through in obedience to you. And now he is King of kings and Lord of lords, waiting to be unveiled before the whole of creation. Lord, lead us to him, we pray. Help us to walk with him, we pray. Even if none go with us, help us to wear our cross so that we can wear our crown one day in your presence. Lead us, we pray, as we ponder these deep truths for Jesus' glory. Amen. Amen. We're going to close by singing The Potter's Hand, a song all about God molding us and making us sometimes in ways we don't want Him to. How do you shape the clay? The clay wants to go this way. The potter says, no, this way. Uh, Mold me, make me, is what the song is asking. So we'll stand to sing this. Um, We're going to go into communion. If you need to go now, you're very welcome to do that. Thank you so much for being here. Please, you can go during the last hymn. If not, we'll stay behind and we'll... Um, share bread and wine together. But let's stand and sing the potter's hand.